Good afternoon and welcome to Baptist Health International's quarterly medical lecture. I am Dr. Galat Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located in the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator in today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Peter Gambanza, who will be presenting a lecture titled, Review of New Medical and Minimally Invasive Surgi Surgical Options for the Management of Uterine Fibroids. Dr. Gambanza is a board-certified obstetrician, gynecologist, and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgeon at Baptist Health South Florida. He specializes in minimally invasive and endoscopic surgery, urogynecology and pelvic reconstructive surgery, and complementary and in integrative medicine. Dr. Gambanza received his uh, medical training at Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., from which he graduated with honors. He attended the National Naval Medical Center at Maryland for his internship and his residency in obstetrics and gynecology. As a Galloway Foundation Fellow, he worked in the Gynecological Oncology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer uh, Center in New York. Dr. Garbanza served as a decorated officer in the U.S. Navy from 1995 to 1999, both at Bethesda Naval Hospital and overseas, where he held positions such as Chief of Division of Ambulatory Obstetrics and Gynecology and Director of a Colposcopy Minimally Invasive Clinic an assistant professor of the Uniformed Services, uh, University of Health Sciences. He was an associate clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Uniformed Service University of the Health Sciences in Georgetown University School of Medicine in Georgetown University School of Midwifery. Dr. Gambanza has received numerous teaching awards and commendations during his teaching career, including teacher and mentor of the year and faculty award more recently, he was honored with the Leonard Town Humanism in Medicine Award. This award, uh, sponsored by the Arnold P. Gold Foundation, recognizes a faculty member for clinical excellence and compassionate care in the clinical practice. Dr. Gambanza was an active reservist in the United States Navy, where he held the rank of commander. He is currently an associate clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Florida International University of Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. He has published several articles in peer-reviewed journals and has presented in numerous uh, societal meetings and clinical congresses. He's a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the fellow of American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. Dr. Gambanza is an active member in the Society of Gynecolo Gynecological Surgeons, the American Association of Gynecology, Laparoscopist, American Euro Oncology Society, among others. Dr. Gambanza is a board certified in three specialties, obstetrics and gynecology, female pelvic medicine, and reconstructive surgery, as well as in minimally invasive surgery, in addition to being a certified surgical coach by the Academy for Surgical Coaching, and, uh, and he is one of the few providers in South Florida to be a fellow of the International Society of the Study of Women's Sexual Health and specializes in addressing issues of hypoactive sexual disorders and vaginal pain, among other conditions. Let's, let's give a warm welcome to this incredible physician, Dr. Peter Gambanza. Dr. Gambanza, what a pleasure having you with us this afternoon. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it. Such a nice introduction. Welcome, everybody. A pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm going to like to review uh, a little bit of the presentation on fiber. So I'll become from very basic to the ultimate technologies we have for the management of fibroids, both medical and surgical. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that not only you're able to identify fibroids, what they are, where they can be located, what clinical presentation the patients might present with, but also what are the different modalities we have to diagnose and to manage the fibroids. So what Dr. If I Dr. Gambanza, I apologize to interrupt. Uh, please share your presentation once again. It's not projecting. Apologies. No problem. Okay. 
Perfect. Apologies again. So no, don't worry about it, Dr. Gambans. Thank you. So briefly again, um, I want to make sure you you're able to identify it and uh, uh, not only how it diagnose the different methods to diagnose the fibers, but the different management uh, um, alternatives we have available. So what are fibers? They're essentially benign, non-cancerous monoclonal tumors that appear in the wall of the uterus. They usually made out of smooth muscle, but also have a fair amount of fibrous connected tissue. And they're usually fed vascularly by the uterine vasculature. They're also called by different names, lyomyomas, lyomyomata, myoma, or simply fibroids. Uh, from the Latin, lyo, smooth, myo, muscle, enoma, tumor, that's a whole name and last name, lyomyoma. They're fairly well circumscribed, and they sometimes can go either from single or multiple. They're extremely sensitive to sex steroids, and they can vary in size from millimeters to more than 20, 25 centimeters. Um, usually there's a lot of pain, discomfort uh, due to these uh, fibroids. These fibroids can be located in different areas on the uterus. Uh, intramural means in between the muscle, and I'll have you guys can see my pointer. So if we have the fundus or the top of the uterus, here are the fallopian tubes, the ovaries. They can be intramural in the middle of the muscle. They could be underneath the mucosa or submucosal or underneath the serosa, subserosal. Pedunculated means they're going to have a small pedicle, a small little stalk where usually the blood supply goes through. And that pedunculated fiber could be in the cavity or could be pedunculated outside into the abdominal cavity. Um, obviously, they, they can have a variation of those because some of them can go all the way through the serosa, through the uh, myometrium, and through the mucosa as well. So a FIGO, the uh, Federación Internacional of Gynecology and Obstetricians, uh, classify the fibers with a little more specific uh, uh, technique. And essentially, we diagnose them in Roman numerals from one to six. Uh, to give you an example in the diagram, which is a little bit a little bit more valuable, this is what the FIGO classification shows here. So type zero, one, and two are going to be in the cavity. And the one and two is going to be a variation on how much of that uh, fibroid is in the muscle wall versus how much is it outside of it. This is an example of that range two to five. It could be all the way from outside to the inside. I actually have a patient that I'll be operating next week. The simple subserosal fibroids, type six and five. And again, this depends on how much of those fibroids are close to the serosa. So this is a little bit more specific than you mentioning, I have a subserosal fibroid. If it's a type five, it gives you a little bit of a mental picture. So we normally use the fibro classification when we're discussing fibers amongst each other, but also when we use any imaging. Incidence and prevalence, where usually they're more common at, at ages 30 and 40, but they can occur at any age. And I'm gonna mention a little bit later why that age in particular. They're more common in African-American women to have more preponderance in that population, as well as the Latin community. But we know that some of those women don't, do not have any symptoms. So although the incidence might be skewed to those who have symptoms, there's a large majority of patients who unfortunately do not have any symptoms and do have fibroids. Um, and this is what I mentioned, that the prevalence is sometimes under, underestimated. It can be, you know, we say around 50% of patients have fibroids, but that can range a little higher to up to uh, upper 60 to 68%. Um, risk factors could be menarchial early age, any familial disposition in obesity. And as I mentioned, there's some race, uh, race affecting the, uh, the ability of having fibroids. Um, half of the women who have fibroids have symptoms. And those symptoms, of course, vary depending on the size, location of the fibroid. Those could be presenting with abnormal bleeding, bleeding irregularly, bleeding heavy. They have a pelvic mass. They might present with back pain. They might present with sciatica. They might present with urinary symptoms, urinary frequency, urinary incontinence, because that fibroid is causing a large pressure into the anterior bladder, similar to a pregnancy. 
um, they can cause infertility. Those fibers are in the cavity and the pregnancy cannot really plant in a normal contour cavity. So how the patients might come in? The patient might simply come in for your regular examination telling you that her peers are a little bit longer or a little bit heavier. They're changing paths more often. They might have variability in the bleeding. They might be bleeding you know, twice a month or because mom bled for approximately eight to 10 days and they're bleeding the same, they think, okay, this is okay. My mom did it, I'm doing it. But then when you decide to do blood work, you find out that they're anemic. And then that perhaps prompts you to evaluate the patient further. Another set of patients will have pain and that could be pain with intimacy, as I mentioned in the lower back, in the lower abdomen, dyspareunia, which is pain during intimacy, sciatica, uh, and essentially, those, those uh, patients can be very debilitated from the fibers and the pelvic pain. Um, as I mentioned, not only urinary symptoms could be common because the fiber can put pressure anteriorly, but similarly, the fibers can put pressure posteriorly and, put, and cause the patient to have constipation, rectal pain, or you know, rectal uh, or, or bowel irregularities due to that, as well as abdominal cramps because the fibroids, given that they're very well vascularized can also degenerate and cause non-cyclic pelvic pain. Obviously the uterus is gonna be enlarged. The patient is gonna have some discomfort. They might present with miscarriages and that's how you find sometimes the, uh, some mucus fibroids or the patient might not be able to get pregnant. As I mentioned, half of the patients that have fibroids are symptomatic, but we have that other 50% that are totally asymptomatic. And it's during a regular examination that you might feel, hmm, this uterus it might be a little bit bigger. Let me proceed with imaging. And you do find that the patient has some fibroids. Unfortunately, fibroids do affect the quality of life and the activities of daily living. And this study definitely show how the severity of that not only caused concern, but the decrease in affecting activities, the energy, the mood, how self-conscious they were, if they had a belly and people were telling them, my God, Maria, are you pregnant? And essentially she's not pregnant. She just has a large abdomen and distended due to the fibroid. So a lot of either obvious causes, as I mentioned, the pain, the bleeding, but there are other factors that might affect the patient with fibroids with their activity of daily bleedings. How the fibroids become fibroids, but the theory becomes that we, we all start with that stem cell that becomes a normal myometrial cell. And due to the signaling of estrogen and progesterone, that mature lyme myoma cell decides to uh, generate a lot of extracellular matrix. And that becomes almost like a snowball effect in creating that enlargement of that connective tissue together with the smooth muscle. Uh, we mentioned that the incidence of fibers in between the 30s and 40s. And the reason for that is uh, in prepubescent women, the estrogen and progesterone uh, is, is on the really minimal or low levels. As women reach puberty and then reproductive age, they get pregnant, they have an increase in estrogen and progesterone, which makes in turn an increase in size in uh, complaints of those fibroids. In turn, when the patient becomes menopausal in those estrogen and progesterone uh, uh, availability in the patient's bloodstream decreases, the sensitivity of the fibroids and the receptors on the fibroids decrease in that function and then stop growing and at times minimize. They don't go away, but then definitely minimize in their size. We know that fibroids have high level of estradiol, aromatase, and also progesterone and receptor alpha, estrogen alpha. And we know that indeed they are responsive to estrogen and progesterone, because as I mentioned, we know that in pregnancy, they exponentially grow. And then after they were been delivers, the fibers go back and shrink a little bit to almost pre-pregnancy size, sometimes not all of them. And yet again, when the woman becomes menopausal, the uh, fibers shrink or decrease in size. We also have enough data not showing that there's evidence of decrease in fiber size when we use GNA, GNA uh, receptor agonists and also antagonist therapy, which we'll be talking in a little bit. How do we diagnose fibroids? Well, uh, first simple thing, doing a physical exam and uh, appreciating that the fiber might be slightly enlarged above the symphysis pubis, might be somewhat irregular, might be tender or non-tender. 
uh, and those are the first the first cues that you might have on that simple examination. Uh, as gynecologists, we obviously use the modality of ultrasound, and that is a way where sound waves are used to create a picture of the uterus and the pelvic organs. Um, those masses can become either hyperechoic if they have some calcifications. They can be hypoechoic if they have some blood or they have some degener degeneration. So they can be very obvious on sonography. But in addition to ultrasound, we can also use magnetic resonance imaging, which can also give us a, a, a almost three-dimensional view of what the fibroids are, but also if they have a nice capsule or they have any suspicious for any uh, potential degeneration or potential changes to any leiomyosarcoma. We pretty much have gone away from any simple um, radiation and x-rays and CT. Those modalities don't tell to add any more than the first two ultrasound and MRI. This is an example of a ultrasound and some mucous fiber. You see the X marks over here and you see a little bit of a hyperechoic with some hypoechoic areas, which are the areas that might be the generator on the fiber. But you can see it's almost like a little circle. It's a little bulb and the, and the, the, the fibers, most of them tend to have almost a circular fashion, but some, some of them could be a little bit pear-shaped, but they tend to have that world of, of a circular fashion. Hence why I mentioned the snowballing effect because they tend to grow with that extracellular matrix. We can also um, use um, son sonography with saline and this is an example of a saline infusion sonography on the right. We put through the speculum a small pipel infused it with saline. And here we can clearly delineate that this fibroid, as I mentioned, becomes a little bit of a maybe type two, type three, because you know we can say, okay, it's 50% into the cavity, 50 outside the cavity. Here's a fiber, let's say when we see it without this on a histogram, and here we have a better view having a better quality. And that can provide a better image to the physician in, in a way of planning any potential surgery for the patient. Another way of diagnosing uh, besides an imaging with, with, with a hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is using a camera through the cervix, entering through the lower urine cervix and in the cervical canal and viewing the uterine cavity. This essentially will allow us to view in detail the tubal ostia or the entrance of the fallopian tubes, but any masses that we'll have in the cavity. Similarly, in another imaging way, we can do hysterosalpingography, where akin to the sonohistogram, we're putting, instead of fluid, as we do in the sonogram, we put a dye that's radiolucent. We take series of x-rays, and as we put the dye through the uterine cavity, we might be able to appreciate the, um, the uh, fibroid in the cavity. Laparoscopy, now it's another way of diagnosing fibroids, and that would be going camera through the umbilicus and providing a, a um, overview of the whole pelvis, abdomen, liver, gallbladder, and of course, focusing on our pelvic organs to evaluate tubes, ovaries, and the uterus. And at that time, uh, even though the patient might have imaging before, we might be able to have a uh, the identification of fibers at that time. Here is a view of the hysteroscope, and you can see this is a, you know, some mucous fiber that looks like it might have a pedicle that might need to be resected. Whereas here in a hysterosalpingogram, similar to the sonohistogram, but this is a, an x-ray. Um, perhaps this lady was having evaluation for fertility to uh, evaluate the fallopian tubes. With the dye, we see the presence of a hypoechoic area, and we can pretty much you know, ascertain that that could be the likelihood of a fibroid. Um, again, another views of uh, sonohistogram, and this is on the bottom, a normal view where there's nothing in the cavity. And here, you know, with the ceiling that clearly delineates the edges of any mass inside the cavity, uh, and we can diagnose cert with certainty that there's a intracavitary fibroid mass. Laparoscopy, of course, going through the belly button. We have the uterus in the middle, fallopian tubes, and this will be a pedunculated fibroid in the posterior aspect of the uterus. This is around three, four centimeters. So the surgeon might perhaps potentially resect it over there, making sure there are no other masses or fibroids in the cavity. So once the patient gets diagnosed with fibroids, we want to address with the patient and have a nice discussion with the patient 
what is their goal? And as I mentioned, the patient is asymptomatic. She just says, well, I don't have any pain. Well, we can monitor that fibroid over years with imaging and sonogram. But if the patient does have symptoms, and I mentioned she could have pain, she could have irregular bleeding, we need to then determine from the patient, are we presenting fertility? Is the patient interested in fertility? Or simply, the patient might have done her childbearing, but she really wants to preserve the uterus. So those are the two main qualities that we wanna make sure when we're discussing management for the patient. The treatment landscape is various because we can go from, again, doing nothing at all, doing medical therapy, inter intervening in some way, which could be medical therapy or doing uh, interventional radiology uh, methods that could assist in the, in the betterment of the symptoms of the fibroids. And obviously we can do surgery, which is what I do. Uh, the symptoms management um, uh, tier could be if a patient is simply having pain, not bleeding, we can use some acetaminophen, we can use some anti-inflammatory agents. If they're having painful bleeding, but no heavy pain, certainly any, any medical therapy could be appropriate. Targeted therapy becomes related to any of the items related to the bleeding. There's definitely medical therapy, which we'll be discussing in a second, that is targeted for fibroid management that can improve the amount of bleeding that the patient will have monthly. And yet again, there's newer available medical therapy that is literally targeting the uh, receptors, their GNRH receptor antagonists, and thereby, by their action, they're decreasing the progesterone and estrogen receptors, and thereby decreasing the size of the fibroids. For those patients who either have tried medical therapy, have failed, or are looking for the surgical option, we have surgical options where we can actually remove the fibroids. The removal is called myomectomy. That procedure can be done either hysteroscopically, meaning through the vagina and the cervix, as the picture that I show you, or through laparoscopy. And uh, the laparoscopic could be done uh, regular conventional laparoscopy or using the Da Vinci robot uh, platform. Hysteroscopy will, will be the ultimate management where we remove the whole uterus cervix for the management of fibroid, depending again on the patient's symptoms and size. So focusing on medical therapy, we talk about treating symptoms. And on symptoms, I, I need to add another tier here was the use of uh, pain management, anti-inflammatory, but we have transidemic acid, which essentially is extremely, extremely helpful in decreasing the bleeding for those women that have heavy bleeding during their cycles. Hormonal suppression, which could be regular oral contraceptives, either of progesterone only or oral contraceptives, as well as Depo-Provera, uh, given intramuscularly by, again, doing a suppression of that hormone, the patient will be able to cycle, ovulate, and have a decrease in the fluctuation and pulsatile fashion of both estrogen and progesterone, thereby stabilizing the fibroid size. Targeted therapy refers to uh, Depolupron uh, or uh, GNH receptor agonists, um, but now we have a new category, which are GNRH receptor antagonists. Transdynamic acid, as I mentioned, do, do we do have data that does decrease uh, menstrual bleeding compared to placebo. And for those patients who do not want any hormonal option, this could be an attracted alternative. On the contrary, there might be patients that might be considering hormonal contraception with a combined oral contraceptives, but they do not want to deal with the daily use of a pill. Well, we can use the liver and orgestrel into uterine device and we place it in, uh, in, a, in, a, in the office. That could be staying there for around five years. If the patient is happy, we can take it out, put it again in five years, particularly for that patient that might have uh, fibroids causing severe heavy bleeding. However, if we have a fibroid, as I show in the picture in the cavitary, that will be a little bit challenging to put that fibroid in the, in the cavity if, if, if the actual T, if you will, might be either impinging on the fiber or may not be able to obtain its accurate, accurate precision in the fundus of the cervix. And certainly we have the combined, the combined uh, uh, um, uh, oral contraceptives, uh, which are easily accessible and at low cost. Um, the medications that I mentioned improve heavy bleeding. And as I mentioned, oral contraceptives do this, being the pill, being the Depo-Provera, being the intrauterine device. 
the wound to the gonadal troparin releasing hormone agonists, they work in the pituitary ovarian axis. And they tend to stop the menstrual cycle. As I mentioned, they're shrinking fibers because they're decreasing that pulsatile release of uh, estrogen and progesterone. However, we have a limited time that we're able to use the generic receptor agonists because they have side effects of bone loss, osteoporosis, vaginal uh, dryness, but also the main issue, which is the menopausal symptoms and night sweats. We can certainly use them for a little bit longer than six months if you use add back therapy. And add back therapy means that you use a progestin with it to minimize the symptoms. Um, the receptor antagonists work in a different way. They competitively uh, and reversibly bind to the GnRH receptors in the pituitary gland, and they block the release of LH and FSH, thereby again suppressing the estrogen and progesterone. They do not cause that surge that GnRH agonists do. At the beginning, a lot of women, when they have the GnRH or the depot lupron uh, shot, they have you know, an increase in size of the fibroid, increase in symptoms for those who use depolupron for endometriosis. But then after the, um, the uh, uh, there's a paucity of, of the release of the pulsatile effect is when you see a little bit of an effect of the shrinkage. And again, as I mentioned, they also tend to cause some heart flushes, headaches and nausea, as well as weight gain. Uh, so the they, they other a newer uh, alternative that um, is still experimental in, in some places like Japan, it might be available, are selective progesterone receptor modulators. So I wanted to let you know there, there's a lot more options that are available for patients that uh, as obstetricians and gynecologists, we can have in our armamentarium to offer patients. This uh, newer agents particularly target the uh, receptor expressed in the fibroid and inhibit the cell proliferation to induce the apoptosis. This is a little bit of a graph telling you where we are. We have used mifepristone, which is a, a, a you know more of an aromatase inhibitors. Here on the left side, we have GnRH analogs in the newer category of uh, elagolix, rulogolix, and elagolix, which are the GnRH receptor antagonists. Uh, as I mentioned, the benefits of the agonists are that they actually shrink the fibers pretty well, but we have a, a limited time. And uh, as I mentioned, we have that three to six one mark that cause that vasomotor symptoms. And we have to be cautious because uh, unless we do add back therapy to maybe give the patient a year, you know, we have that unlimited time uh, of use. Uh, so this perhaps sometimes is used to shrink the fibroid to, uh, to a level that perhaps I can accommodate the patient to a minimally invasive approach. And instead of doing a laparotomy, or a C-section incision type, I can use the Da Vinci platform and remove a, a now more manageable fibroid and take it that way. The receptor antagonists, unlike the GnRH agonists, are oral. So this is a new category that came in over the past year or two, at least in the United States, and they do not have that initial stimulation of gonadotropin release, they in turn have immediate reversible, and I wanna, I wanna uh, emphasize that is reversible suppression of the gonadotropin secretion. This what it causes the rapid reduction of estradiol level, which in turn is gonna cause a decrease in the size of the fibroid. So now we're attacking with pharmacology, knowing how the fibroids are sensitive to estrogen, and we're using tools from injectables to now to oral medications to improve the patient's symptoms. The Elagolix is the one that we have in the United States uh, in Rulagolix is available in Japan. I think we, we approved Rulagolix recently in the United States. So we have two options available in the United States to treat patients with fibroids. For the medical therapy, again, uh, the way I want to summarize it is what is the patient's goals? If it's patients having bleeding, well, we want to improve that bleeding. We want to decrease that menstrual bleeding. And that one we can control, as I mentioned, with intrauterine device. We can do oral contraceptives. And certainly we can use then the newer targeted therapy, which depending on your country and your insurance coverage, that is something that perhaps could be very effective since we're especially targeting the, the fiber receptors for shrinking of that fiber.
if in turn the patient is having pressure or pain, we definitely then are more tailoring in the pain management, but we need to sometimes complement that pain management with the use of maybe a targeted therapy as a GnRH receptor agonist to reduce that fibroid size. So we, we hopefully with the goal of that is improving the patient's quality of, of life, which as I mentioned before, the, the fibroids tend to cause a lot of issues. Uh, since I'm a minimally invasive surgeon, this is some of the newer techniques that I wanna share with you, but I wanted to paint for you a, a picture of all the options that we have available. As I mentioned before, myomectomy is the removal, the surgical removal of fibroids, and that can be done through an open technique, through a laparoscopic technique, through a da Vinci platform technique, or through a hysteroscopy. So that could be, you know, vaginally as well, depending where the fibroids are located. So essentially, we want to treat it for those patients who are having pain, bleeding primarily, they're having problems with fertility, that fibroid is in the cavity. So we have a myriad of options to offer the patient depending on where uh, the patient's symptoms are. At times, I have patients that they have both intracavitary fibroids and they have exophytic or pedunculated fibroids on the outside. So I have to do a combination therapy where I go initially vaginally through a hysteroscopy, the camera, in a surgical morselator that we have available. And then while I go laparoscopically or robotically and remove the fibroids from above. This is an example of a laparoscopic uh, um, uh, myomectomy that I'll play for you briefly. The patient is a 32-year-old female with a 10-centimeter fundal intramural uterine fibroid a benign and hormone-sensitive tumor arising from the muscular wall of the uterus, which causes significant bulk symptoms and heavy menstrual bleeding. She was pre-treated with a three-month course of luprolide acetate, Lupron, in order to induce amenorrhea, optimize hemoglobin, and shrink the fibroid prior to surgery. A laparoscopic myomectomy, surgical removal of a fibroid from the uterus, was planned. Laparoscopic myomectomy may be considered in cases where there is adequate uterine mobility and sufficient space for visualization and surgical access. It is typically limited to less than 5 to 10 fibroids on imaging with the largest fibroid not exceeding 10 centimeters. A transverse uterine incision is used to facilitate laparoscopic suturing for closure. The length of the incision must be gouged in relation to the diameter of the fibroid to ensure successful enucleation. Care must be taken to avoid extension towards the fallopian tubes or the uterine arteries. The incision will be made down to the level of the fibroid. Proper identification of the fibroid plane facilitates enucleation as well as minimizes bleeding. Care should be taken to ensure that the endometrial cavity is not harmed during the enucleation process. The fibroid plane will be dissected circumferentially to allow for enucleation. And the fibroid will be removed. A barbed suture will be used to reapproximate the myometrium in layers. So that was a brief overview of, of uh, a myomectomy. And um, I put that because sometimes it's a little bit more visual than, um, than um, the pictures, uh, but I have someone there. Um, certainly in that case, they, they refer to using that 
uh, lubricacetate or, or GnRH analog to shrink that fiber, as I mentioned, to allow that uh, uh, procedure to be done minimally invasive. I, I do not have a limit on, on the number of fibroids. Certainly have taken more than 20 at a time. In size in itself, well, I can certainly take a bigger size fibroid, but I'll have to then internally morselate the fibroid and then either remove it vaginally through a vaginal incision in the cul-de-sac or extend a little bit the umbilical incision to then morselate the fibroid through a bag. Other surgical management that I know might need, but I don't want my colleagues in the interventional radiology uh, team are uterine fibroid molestation. In what this process, what we're doing is we're minimizing the blood supply to the uterus in by decreasing the blood supply. Obviously, we're going to be hopefully decreasing the growth of the uterus. But since we're blocking the blood supply to the uterus, just like if you have any coronary artery blocked, you're going to have spasm, you're going to have pain. Immediately afterward, the patient's going to have some cramping, some pain, a little bit of a low-grade fever, some, some chances of infection. But this is, again, a patient who might not want to have a hysterectomy. They have large fibroids. Maybe they already have tried the GnRH analogs. They have maxed out. At least they're able to you know, minimize the, the fibroid size enough that at least they might be happy with um, only, um, only that procedure. But unfortunately, there's a percentage of patients that with that procedure, they still have issues with pain, continued growth of the fibroid, and they end up with further surgical uh, need, hysterectomy or hysterotomy. Um, this is a little bit of a brief example of the uterine embolization. This video has been produced to familiarize you with the uterine fibroid embolization procedure, UFE. UFE is a safe, effective treatment for fibroids that has been performed for nearly 20 years. It is one of several treatments that may be used to treat fibroids in the uterus. Uterine fibroids are non-cancerous growths that develop from normal uterine muscle cells. There are four types of fibroids that develop in or just outside of the uterus. Submucosal fibroids grow into the uterine cavity. Intramural fibroids grow within the wall of the uterus, and substarosal fibroids develop on the outside of the uterus. Pedunculated uterine fibroids occur when a fibroid tumor grows on a stalk, resulting in pedunculated submucosal or subserosal fibroids. All fibroids require a supply of blood to survive and grow. UFE takes advantage of this fact to target the fibroids. Uterine fibroid embolization is a minimally invasive procedure. UFE does not remove the uterus or the ovaries. A small incision is made in the leg to gain access to the femoral artery. A long flexible tube called a catheter is then inserted into the femoral artery. It is guided up the femoral artery and into the artery that supplies blood to the uterus called the uterine artery. The catheter is then guided to smaller arteries that supply blood to the fibroids. Uterine fibroid embolization delivers tiny microspheres to the artery that supplies the fibroids, cutting off the blood flow, causing the fibroids to shrink. The tiny microspheres are injected through the catheter and travel through the blood vessel. Since the microspheres are more than 60 times larger than red blood cells, they plug the tiny vessels that red blood cells travel through to feed the fibroid. The procedure is repeated in the uterine artery on the other side to make sure that all blood supply to the fibroids has been cut off. All fibroids are treated simultaneously. Once the blood supply to the fibroids has been blocked, the fibroids begin to shrink. There is no scar tissue and minimal blood loss with UFE. Recurrence of the fibroids with uterine fibroid embolization is rare. Most women are able to return to light activity within a few days of the UFE treatment and are usually back to work and normal activity on average within 11 days. Take back your life today. Ask your doctor if uterine fibroid embolization is the right treatment for you. So that was a, a procedure again done by the interventional radiology team that again, it's uh, uterine sparing uh, in not even uh, an incision except for that incision in the groin. Yet another uh, uh, procedure done by the radiology team, so believe it or not, 
uh, besides gynecologists, some, some, some other specialties can help us tackle and manage this, this disease process is magnetic resonance imaging guided ultrasound surgery. So what we do is we actually use the MRI, but using sonogram waves, we're able to um, target that fibroid and increase the temperature, thereby causing some you know, uh, changes on the, on the protein uh, lattices in degenerating uh, with the hopes of decreasing its size and thereby decreasing its symptoms. A brief, brief review of this procedure uh, for you guys to watch. One option for treating uterine fibroids is non-invasive MR-guided focused ultrasound ablation. The procedure uses MRI as guidance for the radiologist to pinpoint the area in the core of the uterine fibroid where the ultrasound waves will be focused. When many ultrasound waves converge on a single area, it creates enough heat to destroy the tissue. The procedure is repeated over and over until the central core of the fibroid is destroyed. So that's really techy technique. It's almost like using, uh, this, in this case, definitely unlike the uterine embolization, there's no incisions. You're usually using, you know, uh, sonogram waves to manage that fibroid. Um, so we have now yet added another One tool to, um, to our procedure. Hysterostomy, of course, is where we remove the uterus, uh, and that can be done, as I mentioned, abdominally, laparoscopically, or um, um, robotically. Uh, I'm going to skip the video for hysterectomy because I'm assuming most of you might be familiar with the removal of the uterus. Uh, and we'll talk about the advances that we have done surgically. Uh, I'm proud to say that I'm the only physician in South Florida in uh, Baptist is the only one in the in the Florida area that has access to the laparoscopic rate of frequency ablation as well as the uh, hysteroscopic rate of frequency ablation. So let's talk a little bit more about that. What I'm actually doing is I'm going laparoscopically and I'm using an ultrasound. Instead of doing a transabdominal ultrasound, I'm actually doing an intraabdominal ultrasound. Um, we have noticed that doing an ultrasound directly into the uterus, and this is nothing new. Remember, a lot of people with um, in the uh, surgical oncology field do sonograms on the livers for biopsies and they use radio frequency too. So we have adopted that technique and use it for fibroids. As I mentioned, fibroids tend not to be malignant, um, although a small percentage, one in 500 can become malignant, but we have used that technology of using radio frequency to increase uh, and do a coagulative necrosis on the fibroids with a needle. Um, this is an example. I go through the belly button. The second port is done below the belly button around uh, the area of the fundus of the uterus. I have two screens. One screen is my regular laparoscopic view, which is right here, and I see the two fibroids. And this is my ultrasound probe. And if you, uh, uh, any of you are familiar with radiology or, son or uh, GYN sonography, we have a vaginal probe. This is a probe similar to the ones you have in the vagina, but it's, it's tailored for intraabdominal use. And these are the views that I'm seeing. We have noted that doing intraabdominal sonograms, we can, pop, we can pick up three times as much fibroids as through a transvaginal approach or an MRI because we're right there. So there's a lot of small intramural fibers that might be one to two centimeters that maybe depending on the patient's body habitus, if they have a large BMI, they might not be able to be identified. So this is a very novel technique, very easy. While I'm there with the ultrasound, I deploy um, my needle. That needle has an array of needles that open up. And once I know a safe zone, uh, the safe zone is determined by creating 3D imaging. We actually have um, put some special magnetic pads that in turn show in the diagram of the sonogram where my needle is and where the fibroid is. So here's a view of the fibroid. This is deployment of the needles. And this is how the... Uh, software shows the area of my deployment. And I want to make sure that an area in yellow, 
you know, is within the area of the serosa or the outer capsule of the fibroid. Once I deploy the pedal, it will tell me how much uh, and how many wattage and how long I might need to ablate that fibroid. Sometimes a fibroid might need several passes to make sure it gets to the right temperature and I'm able to uh, certainly say that we'll have some coagulative necrosis. So if you remember how we were doing the MRI guided ultrasound uh, ablation, again, we're using temperature, but we're using that from far away. Here, I'm actually doing direct management of the fiber one by one, but with, with, with myself, not only looking at them at the sonogram, but using the needle and the array with radio frequency to treat them with energy and by thereby increasing the energy uh, uh, doing that coagulative necrosis. Let me show you a quick video on this technique. The assessor procedure, also known as laparoscopic radiofrequency ablation, is an FDA-cleared outpatient procedure that can safely and effectively treat nearly all sizes and locations of uterine fibroids. The Assessor ProView is the first and only fully integrated system with radio frequency ablation, laparoscopic ultrasound, and guidance mapping. The procedure is performed using a standard 5 millimeter laparoscope and a 10 millimeter laparoscopic ultrasound probe for visualization of nearly all fibroids. Under ultrasound guidance, the Assessor handpiece is inserted into the fibroid and the seven thin needle-like electrode arrays are deployed into the fibroid tissue. The guidance system overlays the ultrasound image with the projected path of the handpiece. Radio frequency energy is emitted through seven electrode arrays. Based on the length of the electrode array deployment, the system automatically calculates the dimensions of the intended treatment zone and the duration of the ablation. After each ablation, the arrays are retracted into the handpiece shaft before the handpiece is withdrawn from the fibroid with coagulation. The steps are repeated with overlapping ablations until all the fibroids are fully treated. The heat generated from the radio frequency energy causes thermal destruction of the fibroid through coagulative necrosis. The extracellular protein matrix of the fibroid is denatured and broken down into small fragments that are reabsorbed by the surrounding normal tissue causing the previous fibroid mass to soften and shrink over time. Postoperative pain is typically mild. Most patients return to daily activities in three to five days. Fibroid symptoms, including heavy menstrual bleeding, urinary frequency, abdominal distension, and pelvic pain typically resolve or significantly improve within three months and continue to improve over a year. Most patients experience long-term satisfaction and relief. Assess a health, giving women more options. So again, that's one of the radio frequency ablation techniques that we have available. This is what the uh, operating room will look like. I'll have the patient in the operating room and I have two monitors, one for my regular laparoscopic view. And the next to it will be the one that is showing me the sonogram. So I'm doing both at the same time. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm proud to say that Baptist is the only facility in, uh, in uh, Florida that is, has the accessible procedure, and I'm the only one doing the procedure uh, thus far, trying to encourage other of my colleagues to have another innovation in, in technology and provide yet another alternative for the management of fibroids for women in, in, the, in, the, in the area. Uh, in inviting you, uh, all of you in the South America and the Caribbean, to uh, come and visit us to watch the procedure or even consult us if you have any patients that you see might be candidates for this. This is a view on the right of a myomectomy. So we open, as you saw from that video, we make the incisions, we have to close it up as, as, as best as we can, particularly if the patient is pursuing pregnancy in the future. Um, it's, it's, it's laborious, particularly if you have more than one fibroid, and again, once you have all that done, you have to deal with taking those fibroids out. So it, it is a, a, a fun procedure for us to do, but it can get long if you have more than 10 fibroids. And after the 10, you have to close those 10 holes. And then you have to take those 10 fibroids either from the bottom or some sort of way, either through the abdomen and, and extend the incision. On the excess, on the other hand, you simply are putting the probe, you are providing the energy 
And although you're not taking the fibroid out, you're diminishing the volume by doing direct intervention with the rate of frequency and causing that coagulative necrosis. So the, the procedure is a little shorter, but again, depending on how many fibroids you have and how many uh, passes you have to do to treat the fibroid, but yet the patient has definitely much less pain. You can imagine from a stab wound and some cauterization to you know opening and closing the incision. This option is a great option for that woman who might not be ready to have a hysterectomy or perhaps might not be too convinced of doing a myomectomy and want to have an alternative option. Um, right now, the recommendations for access are patients that are not, uh, are not planning on getting pregnant or that we're slowly gathering data because it, it is not contraindicated. Uh, at the beginning, we just that the, the, most of the initial cases were done in, in the folks that were on the uh, late 30s and 40s, not pursuing pregnancy. So right now there are some uh, data collection for patients that are had the excessive procedure and have gotten successful pregnancy subsequently and have been able to deliver vaginally. So they're being treated similar to a VBAC or a vaginal birth after C-section. In the patient who has a myomectomy, at least here, uh, myself in South Florida, I'm recommending a cesarean section. We, however, now get another tool using radiofrequency ablation, but this time is doing hysteroscopically. Uh, there might be fibroids that I'm going to be able to see to obviously through the laparoscope, so there's no need for me to even go through general anesthesia and go through the umbilicus. I can still make them comfortable through sedation or epidental block or paracervical block. And then this time, the same probe that we use um, uh, laparoscopically we are actually inserting it vaginally. However, this uh, format called the Sonata system is able to have the needles and the same probe as the sonogram, and you can deploy it in you want. So let me show you the video of that procedure. So on the Sonata system, the patient is placed in the lithotomy position, similar to doing a hysteroscopy DNC. Similarly, we put some of the um, magnetic um, pads on the knees to, and the thighs to get the 3D image and do our markings. The probe is placed. We're able to see then the fibroid. And with the same probe, I'm able to then deploy with the needle into the fibroid. And you'll see it here as we go. So I'm doing the hysteroscopy, but at the same time, I'm looking at the sonogram. I'm deploying my needle. Once I deploy in the needle is on the direct view. You see that second X shape, if you will. It gives me the area. I can determine how far out I'm deploying the needle. I'm making the, my area a little bit smaller because I want to contain the energy within that area of the fibroid. Once I do, the needle is deployed. Excuse me. And once I'm comfortable on the right place, I step. Uh, I'm sorry, this one is not a step. The Accessa is a button. I create the energy. And very similar to the Accessa on the monitor, we'll have the information regarding the amount of energy, the amount of time, and how much uh, are we treating the fibroid for. Sometimes you can use more than one pass, and we're able to ablate the fibroid. And this setting will be also incisionless. This is another radiofrequency ablation technique that we have available at Baptist Hospital in South Florida. Uh, and again, we're the only ones here providing this technology for our patients. Um, to summarize, uh, fibroids are very common. They're very prevalent. A lot of women, as I mentioned, have uh, no symptoms at all, but a significant women complain of uh, them affecting the uh, activities of daily living or the quality of life. We have different treatment options that are available for the patients, which could be medical, surgical, and radiological as well, such as the uh, uterine audibilization or MRI ultrasound guidance treatment. Um, we have emergent treatments for, for uh, medi medication, as I mentioned, the GNRH receptor antagonist, but also emergent surgical technologies, just like I presented the rate of frequency ablation, which is an exciting option that is not only minimally invasive, but yet effective to minimize the size and the symptoms of women with fibroids. 
In the end, as a physician, you want to make sure you are transparent with the patient and communicate with her all the options available. Use a multidisciplinary approach if you have interventional radiologists in your area to have them present the option before the patient finally making that decision. Using evidence support uh, for providing that information to the patient and more importantly, educate the patient. So the patient feels comfortable that she's having enough autonomy to develop a conscientious decision on what it might be best for her. Emotional support with the family members is important. And of course, we wanna make sure that we provide as many options so we can be inclusive of all the options available in our community. With that, I wanna make sure that I thank you for your time and I wanna have some time for some questions. Dr. Gonzalez, what a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so very much. And we are definitely so proud to have you as uh, the solo a practitioner for the laparoscopic radiofrequency ablation. We're, we're really, really ecstatic about that in itself. Uh, I wanted to just uh, point something out that you uh, mentioned during your conference. And it's the fact that the gamut of symptoms that uh, women present are perhaps uh, the most um, are problematic, especially for the young uh, woman. Uh, you know, we spoke about urine bleeding, the pelvic pain, the dyspareunia perhaps, and of course the obstetric, uh, the effects of uh, obstruction in bladder and rectum. So all this obviously comes out to be one of the most uh, perhaps uh, problematics for the young adult. Uh, but uh, again, we think that uh, one of the biggest complaints uh, is also the fact that the infertility is uh, uh, pervasive in these uh, ladies. So uh, these type of um, uh, procedures that you described, and of course, the hormonal treatments initially, um, uh, does give us a light at the end of the tunnel. And you did mention briefly that uh, fertility can be obviously reversed. So what is the success uh, rate on these type of procedures for women to actually become pregnant? And, and which is that uterus that will be more propense and more candidate for an actual pregnancy? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Hakim. Uh, it is important to find out that some of the patients who might have intracavitary fibroids are the mm -hmm. ones that perhaps have issues either with fertility or perhaps miscarriages. And those, thankfully, are very easy and successfully treated with an hysteroscopic visualization of the fibroid in complete resection because we're actually seeing it and taking it out, leaving now a smooth contour, nice and regular cavity ready for a future pregnancy. The, the time of, of, of rest after a hysteroscopic myomectomy could be a, couple, a, you know, a week at most. And then we allow the patient to have one or two cycles after which he's encouraged to attempt pregnancy. When we have fibroids that are perhaps in the lower uterine segment or in the cavity, they might necessarily directly affect fertility, but they certainly can cause pain and dyspareunia. And at that time is when we have the multiple options open. At that, at that particular woman, if she's pursuing pregnancy, perhaps a medical therapy might not be optimal because that's just only temporary to manage the bleeding and shrink them temporarily. So at that stage, I have to talk to the patient and offer them, listen, we can take the fibroid out. I usually tell the patient if this fibroid is a little bit larger than five, six centimeters and they're trying to get pregnant, I recommend a myomectomy because that fibroid is going to exponentially grow. However, if it's a fibroid that is two, three centimeters, at times I tell the patient, do not worry, let's, let's get you pregnant. You don't have to have fibers removed, but they have, if they have fibers that are on the realm of the four to five or plenty of those, we can do some of the radio frequency ablation procedures where we can then minimize the trauma. As I mentioned, the excess at this juncture is recommended for patients who uh, are, are not considered in pregnancy, not because it's contraindicated, because essentially we don't have the data yet. And now a lot of physicians that are comfortable doing the accessa or the radio frequency laparoscopically have had success with patients getting pregnant because that fibroid, although still there, it is minimized remarkably in size. And imagine a, 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 a baseball a consistency that becomes mm -hmm. the consistency of a marshmallow. Mm -hmm. So that essentially, that decrease in volume in that lattice of the extracellular matrix gets slowly absorbed through the vasculature and either 
expel vaginally as a clear discharge also gets uh, absorbed through the vasculature uh, in the lymphatics and is essentially diuresis. So that's how that volume eventually gets decreased and the patients can become less symptomatic without perhaps having the myomectomy. So if a woman says, you know what, I understand that if I do a myomectomy, I'm gonna have a C-section, then she might be okay doing a laparoscopic or robotic myomectomy. One who might not wanna have a myomectomy, I'm gonna mention, well, I could do an excessive procedure. This is the data available in pregnancy right now. And again, is educating the patient to provide the option. But we have been, at least this last five years, very successful managing fibers in a different way where my only options back then was the pill, hysterectomy or myomectomy. Now I have other medical therapies available that I presented, but also a couple of new options in radiofrequency ablation where we can diminish the size, but also diminish the pain and the bleeding as well for those patients. Mm -hmm. And they used to be a little bit more radical before as well. Uh, now, uh, do you ever combine uh, the type of techniques? Let's say you do a myomectomy. Do you also do ablation? Can, would a woman qualify for both? Or, uh, absolutely. Or Very good active. question. So, sometimes the fibers are, are so dramatically large that I would spend so much time ablating. Then I tell the patient, you know, I'll do myomectomy on that big one that is really accessible, a subsurosal mm -hmm. that you saw in the video, but if she has a couple of the smaller one to two centimeter fibroids, well, I, I might not wanna open the uterus again, but that's a great candidate to put the needle, do the accessa and minimize the volume because she's on her thirties. Well, that two centimeter fibroid now might be a five centimeter fibroid in 10 years mm -hmm. with sure. increasing symptoms of bleeding. So certainly the combination therapy is, is uh, another another thing that we can provide patients with more, more tools in our toolbox for that patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, do they have to actually continue a regimen, a hormonal regimen after that uh, post-op uh, treatment procedure? So, so one of the slides that I presented was the patient's goal. So it's important for me when I meet with a patient is why you go, do you want to get pregnant right away versus, you know what, no, I'm done with my pregnancy mm -hmm. and we can tailor that option. If, if we have uh, uh, issues with bleeding, at times the management might improve the bleeding and she might be really looking forward to discontinuing the medication. That way not only she doesn't have to take it in a daily fashion, but also she might have some unwanted side effects of the hormonal therapy. Yet other ones that after a time, they might say, you know what? I kind of like my cyclicity of the of the pill. I want to stay for it and I don't want to get pregnant. So some of them might stay with it, not necessarily to, to, uh, to, to treat the fibroids because of the convenience of what the hormonal contraception or, or the hormonal methods might offer. There are so many factors that you have to take into account when you see these type of patients. Obviously, age is one of them. And you did mention that uh, uh, obviously uh, older uh, women uh, tend to also manifest these type of uh, fibromes, uh, fibroids, and 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 obviously we did notice that uh, you know a large number of them can actually develop them. Uh, I suppose uh, I'm assuming that uh, the older the patient, uh, the more aggressive perhaps the treatment could be, or perhaps opt for a more radical approach uh, such as a hysterectomy. Is oh, that right. the case? That is correct. And, and then depends again on the patient's choice because she might say, you know what, you're right, I'm not going to get pregnant. The fibers are, are bothering me, my bladder, my rectum, my sciatica. A woman, again, and each woman is different. A woman might tell me, I'm done, I have five kids, I'm okay, saying goodbye to my uterus. Other ones, even though they might not have a, a child, they might still have some affinity to the uterus. And I, I want to be respectful of that. And sure. right now, I have an option where I can uh, uh, offer uterine sparing procedures where that patient can still have some benefit of her symptoms, yet allowing her to keep her uterus. So I think that's very important that we have that tool now available for those patients that my, oh, 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 I, 10 years ago, maybe were forced to have a hysterectomy and maybe mentally, physically, emotionally, they were not ready. Right. I'm going to read a couple of comments uh, for you, if I may, before we let you go. I know you're extremely busy and uh, you took time from your practice. Uh, but uh, Sharon Thompson says, uh, great presentation, excited for the new surgical and medical therapies, always willing to expand options uh, for my patients. Thank you. That's uh, Sharon Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for the beautiful comment. Uh, Shamanique Bodhi uh, is saying, um, 
Uh, what is uh, the fibroid size limit quantity uh, for the ratio radio frequency ablation? Uh, how much time to expect results? How does pain with ablation compare to pain for the UAE? Good question. So for the radio frequency ablation, we don't have a, a limit of size. Uh, again, if this, some at the, at the beginning, if you are dealing with a fiber more than eight centimeters to 10 centimeters, you might have to put that, that, that needle through the fiber several times or use the same incision, but angle it in different ways that you're able to get more of that radius of that fibroid and do deployment. Because that array can give me the temperature, I know if I already have heated that fibroid part, I move that, fibre, that needle to a different area. So I can treat as many fibers. It just will take time because some, some ablations might be 30 seconds or they might be two minutes. Now, remember, if I'm doing a myomectomy, it's taking the whole fibroid, closing it out, closing the incision, and then taking the fiber out. So both are a little bit long procedures, but one might be longer depending on how many fibroids. For the radiofrequency ablation and myomectomy, remember, myomectomy, that fibroid, if the, if the patient had a large eight centimeter, 10 centimeter fibroid. If I'm taking it out via myomectomy, that patient is gonna be immediately feeling that decrease in volume. With the radio frequency, although the pain might be a little bit less than the myomectomy, within a week, and most of my patients within a week already feel a decrease in, 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 in relief of symptoms, if it was blood or back, and some of the patients that come out that month are extremely happy of, of the result of, of the radio frequency ablation. So uh, it, it is very exciting that we have a way that it is minimally invasive and the patient doesn't have to have incisions in the uterus and sutures and potential issues with absorption uh, of the sutures uh, and can allow an easier recovery. Uh, as for the uterine anabolization, because I do not perform it, I don't have too much uh, information of the pain. I know that you know, just like any um, any procedure that's done through the grain, like the, if you do, it's the same approach that you do for any cardiac catheterization. It isn't comfortable on the groin, but remember, for the uterus, you're going to be blocking that fibroid. I'm, I'm sorry, that uterine blood supply. In the the necrosis is not going to be coagulative. It's going to be more ischemic necrosis. So that one is going to be a little bit more painful. And uh, certainly we have to give the patient a little bit of NSAIDs in, in, uh, in a different fashion from my surgical approach. But both of them are fairly well tolerated and uh, but all of them are outpatient. Most of my patients, by the way, who have radiofrequency ablation and have uh, either hysteroscopically or laparoscopically or myomectomy or hysterectomy, they all go home the same day. That is absolutely remarkable, Dr. Gambonsa. And, uh, and, and I loved when uh, you said, well, you were explaining the myomectomy that, uh, you know, it is a fun procedure. <laughs> as long as uh, there are uh, quite a good number of, of them that would not get you that tired. Uh, but it is wonderful to hear that a surgeon is enjoying uh, the craft uh, the way you do, because that uh, only means that uh, you are expanding knowledge and sharing with all of us. Dr. Gambanza, I can keep you here for hours and uh, I won't do that. No, but uh, I appreciate so, it for, for the audience. Uh, you know, my, my website uh, on my practice is drpeterk.com. You're welcome to visit and have a lot of information of the procedures that I mentioned. And you guys can certainly follow me on Instagram, which is hashtag DRPKOBGYN. And you're welcome to message me if you have any questions, any other uh, uh, concerns or any patient referrals. We'll be glad to see you guys when you are here in Miami. That is actually the coolest closing ever. So thank you so very much. And on behalf of our entire team at International, thank you once again for that informative presentation. And to all of you for participating. It is uh, wonderful, Dr. Gambanza. We had about 260 people participating today. If you have any additional questions, as Dr. Gambanza mentioned about today's presentation, please feel free to email us at bhiwebinars at baptishealth.net. We'll make certain to get uh, those questions to Dr. Gambanza for him to elaborate on them, and we will send it back to you. We look forward to seeing you at our next quarterly medical lecture, which is scheduled for Wednesday, May 25th, 2022. In the meanwhile, stay safe. Thank you so very much, and thank you, Dr. Gambanza. Have a wonderful evening.